This is a video that I'm doing for two purposes. I was told after my last one that the sound was still very poor. So between doing the last one and this one, I bought a, a second-hand Dell computer with more power than the little Celeron that I was using before. And I have bought a better quality microphone in the hope that these two things will give me better quality sound. The actual video I'm going to do is explaining the theory of balanced economic growth and proving that the algorithm that I gave in a previous lecture is a valid algorithm to find the maximum rate of economic growth in an economy from its I.O. table. Now, these first few slides are repetitions. I'm saying the use of matrices to represent the economy comes from two guys, uh, Leontiev and von Neumann. Arguably, von Neumann's slightly ahead of Leontiev. But since von Neumann was a mathematician rather than an economist, it didn't initially produce much impact. He had earlier worked on quantum mechanics, um, his mathematical foundations of quantum mechanics. It's very heavy with matrix and linear algebra. And later he went on to invent the von Neumann computer architecture, which is the architecture we still use to this day. His treatment of the economy in terms of matrix operations had a big impact on Marxian economics from the 50s to the 80s. And we see it in later books by Langer in Marishima and much of the formalization of value theory which occurred in the 80s to early 90s. Now, you have to understand the time things were being written. He was writing this in the 30s, which was the peak point of planned Soviet economic growth. Um, and it's arguable, or at least it has been argued by Kurtz and Salvadori, that the von Neumann model is actually a model not of a capitalist economy, but of a state capitalist economy not a competitive capitalist economy. And as such, it's possibly a model for something like China today. He introduced the idea, sorry, von Neumann and then Leontiev introduced the idea of an A matrix, which is basically the technical structure of the economy. It's a matrix which tells you how much of each input is required to produce one unit of output. So I've got a very simple A matrix here, and it, this is means of production, the next column is necessities, then luxuries, then labour. What this is saying is that to produce one unit of necessities requires 0 0.1 expenditure on means of production, 0 0.1 on other necessities, say seed corn, and a small amount of labour. I'm, I'm saying 0.3% since that's typical for an advanced capitalist country. Only 0.3% of the workforce goes there. So basically, the rows and columns have the same titles. The rows tell you where the output of a given industry went and the columns tell you how much was needed to produce one unit of output of the other industry. Now, the simplest thing you can do is to work out what inputs would be required if you wanted a given level of output. So if you have an economic plan, which you can specify as an output vector, it will tell you what the inputs that are going to be required to produce that output are. And that is basically done by a simple matrix to vector product. You multiply the output vector, pre-multiply it, with the matrix A. Uh, here's a simple example in vector Pascal of taking that matrix and 
pre-multiplying the desired output vector, I'm saying one unit of everything uh, with that, to get the inputs that you would require. So when you run it, it prints out the, the A matrix, it prints out what we want as outputs, and it says how much inputs will be required to produce that. And this is the important thing. If we measured the length of these two vectors, the length of the output vector, the length of the input vector, the length of the input vector is less than the length of the output vector. Now that's a fundamental condition for an economy to survive. It must produce more output than it consumes in inputs. And vector length provides an abstract way of doing that across a multitude of different types of input. He established that the maximum rate of growth in the economy, von Neumann established, will occur when it produces its outputs in the same ratio as it uses inputs. What von Neumann was doing here is using a concept that he'd already become very familiar with in quantum mechanics, which is eigenvectors. Um, but it seems a bit odd that something from quantum mechanics turned out to be relevant for Soviet planning. Well, let's look what an eigenvector is. You take an initial vector, and I'm showing the length of the vector there, you, you multiply it by the matrix A, and you get a new vector. The thing about the new vector is that it points in the same direction as the original vector. So an eigenvector is a vector which, when multiplied by a matrix, still points in the original direction, but its length will have changed. Now, in the case of an economic input-output table, an A matrix, the pre-multiplication makes it shorter because it says how much inputs do you need to produce the output. So it produces a shortening of the vector. And this was the, the key understanding, that the, the maximum rate of growth is going to occur when the outputs and inputs are balanced. It simply grows in length without changing its value, and the change in scale is called the eigenvalue of the eigenvector. So if g is an eigenvector of a, a times g produces the effect of multiplying the vector g by a scalar quantity lambda. And as I say, for an economy, lambda will be always less than 1 because we use fewer inputs to produce the output. This is the program I presented before, very slightly changed for clarity and fitting onto the page. And it shows how you can extract the maximum rate of growth of the economy and the eigenvector from an input-output table. Basically, what we're doing is these steps compute the required inputs. And we iterate round, setting the inputs to the, out the outputs to the inputs. OK? We then work out the length of the output vector, its norm, and divide the output vector by its norm. So we're scaling it so it has a length of 1. This prevents the thing exploding or imploding. And we repeatedly do this. And after a certain number of repetitions, we find it will converge on the eigenvector. The question is, why does it work? The reasons for this are twofold. One is that a viable economy will only have one eigenvector. This is due to an obscure theorem called the peron frobenius theorem, um, which is about the properties of matrices which who, all of whose elements are positive 
or zero, no negative elements. And there's another property of eigenvectors is that any vector that is at right angles to the eigenvector, that is say independent of the eigenvector, when multiplied by a will be scaled by less than lambda. This is the Perron Frobenius theorem. It's easier to understand this with the diagram. Suppose g is the balanced growth path and, our, and it's a unit vector after we've normalized it. We multiply, pre multiply it by the matrix A. The effect of that is to, to produce a scaled version of it. I've, I've said A rather than lambda since my graphics package didn't allow me to put in Greek characters. So we get a scaled version of that, that vector when multiplied by the, the um, orthogonal. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm wrong there. I'm, I've misinterpreted this. What I'm saying is that if we had the economy in an initial position x and g is the unit balanced growth vector, we can decompose this into two components one along that direction of length A and another component at right angles, which I've labeled D. That's just simple matrix algebra, uh, vector algebra. In going through this, I'm going to have the following variables. X prime is our initial starting estimate of the growth path. G is our unit eigenvector. E is an error vector of length less than one, g is the small g is the von Neumann optimal growth rate, which is the lambda, the eigenvalues one upon g. D and F are unit vectors orthogonal to the growth path, and A and B are some constants less than one. So I'll go through the proof. Consider an arbitrary starting vector. As I say, we can split it into two components. A G, sorry, a component A along direction G, and a component at right angles D, which is the error or displacement vector. Now, the important thing is to note the displacement vector will have at least one negative coordinate. If we look at this, we can see in this case the x coordinate of D is negative. You can see this visually, but you can show it's an algebraic necessity because the growth vector g is all positive. So a vector at right angles to it has an inner product of zero, and to have an inner product of zero it must have some negative components. As such, this displacement vector is non-economic. That is to say it's something which can't exist in an economy. It involves production of negative quantities of goods. If we perform the iterative step we're repeatedly doing, and 1 upon g is the eigenvector, once we've done the iterative step, we can again split it into two components. E is a new error vector, and this is the scaled version of AG. It's now been scaled by lambda. But this new error vector E will, it will also not be orthogonal. So we can again split that into two components, a component B along the direction G and a component F that is orthogonal. This implies that A times the X prime is going to be b plus a lambda g plus f. So we want to show that f is getting smaller as a percentage. We need to show that the aligned component is growing faster than the orthogonal component. But lambda is what's called the dominant eigenvalue. 
This means that lambda is greater than mu, where mu is the change in length of any non-eigenvector when multiplied by a. It follows, therefore, that lambda is greater than d upon e, and since, well, the, the length of d upon the length of e, and since the length of f is less than the length of e, because we've split it up into two components, and b plus a lambda over lambda must be greater than lambda, it implies necessarily that the length of the new error vector f is le less than the length of the old error vector d. As a consequence, a relative length of the component aligned with g, as opposed to the length of the orthogonal error component, declines, and the new input vector will be close to the maximal growth vector of the economy. What I've done is I've taken a problem from the founder of computing, von Neumann, and I've shown how programming based on matrix vector algebra leads to a very concise code. It's just a few lines of code to work out the maximum length of growth of the economy. And this is significant real-world applications. The Chinese use balanced growth theory in their five-year plans. And further, you can show that purely geometric arguments can be used to confirm the correctness of your computer code. If you are dealing with areas where the computer code maps onto a geometric space like uh, linear algebra. Okay, uh, that's the end of it. This is basically a couple of pages from a textbook that I'm writing on vector programming. So I, I will consider suggestions people have been making for other new um, videos for me to do on things like AI and I'll decide what to do.